Today in this video, I'm going to talk about acute rheumatic fever. Acute rheumatic fever is an inflammatory disease of childhood resulting from untreated streptococcus pyogenes pharyngeal infections. Streptococcus pyogenes is a beta-hemolytic group A streptococcus. For the peak incidence, it is usually seen in 5 to 15 years old and it is more common in females compared to males. For pathogenesis of acute rheumatic fever, it is not direct infection from the bacteria to the heart. Actually, when there is streptococcus infection, it triggers autoimmune reaction in the body and causing inflammation at the valve tissue and also other places. So, when there is streptococcus infection, the body produces antibody to fight against the infection. And this antibody will cross-react with the host tissue in the valve, myocardium and also the joints. That's why this will cause inflammatory lesion in many systems. And some of the severe damages include valvular damage, especially seen in mitral and aortic valve. Valve damage is more common in these two valves, mitral and aortic valve, and less common in pulmonary and tricuspid valve. So the complication is scarring and fibrosis of the valve tissue causing mitral and aortic stenosis. There is a diagnostic criteria for acute rheumatic fever, which is divided into major criteria and minor criteria. The major criteria consists of five, five of these things, which includes carditis, migratory polyarthritis, sedenham chorea, erythema marginatum, and subcutaneous nodules. So for carditis, the evidence might include cardiomegaly, cardiac failure, pericarditis, pathological murmurs heard, or tachycardia out of proportion to fever. These are the, some of the clues that might suggest carditis. Whereas for migratory polyarthritis, it usually affects larger joints. For example, the wrist, the knee, or ankle joints. Sedenham chorea is characterized by involuntary, purposeless movements, followed by motor weakness and hypotonia. And for erythema marginatum and subcutaneous nodules, I will show the picture in the next slide. Whereas for minor criteria, it includes fever, high ESR or high CRP, and prolonged PR interval. So how do we diagnose acute rheumatic fever with this major and minor criteria? As you can see here, I've highlighted in red, with evidence of a preceding group A strep infection, if this is the first time, the initial episode, we need two major criteria to diagnose or one major plus two minor criteria to diagnose. Whereas if this is a recurrent episode, we either need two major criteria or one major plus two minor criteria or three minor criteria is sufficient to diagnose acute rheumatic fever. For this evidence of preceding group A strep infection, it includes the patient having a history of scarlet fever, or there is positive throat swab for group A streptococci, or the antistreptolysin or titer is raised. These are the uh, clues to suggest preceding group A strep infection. So this picture over here is erythema marginatum, which is a characteristic skin rash that appears mostly on the trunk and limbs. It is non-puritic, and we can see that there is pink macules that spread outwards, which, where there is pink borders with a fading center. Whereas for subcutaneous nodule, we can see in two, these two pictures over here. It is usually found on the extensor surface of the joints, and sometimes can be seen on the scalp or spine. For investigations of acute rheumatic fever, we can do full blood count where we expect to see anemia and leukocytosis. For the erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein, they will be elevated. And the third investigation is throat swab for group A streptococcus. We can also do anti-streptolysin or titer, ASLT. Okay, so, and 
in this ASOT, if it is raised, which is more than 200 U per ml, it may suggest group A strep infection. We can also do blood culture, chest x-ray and ECG to look for cardiomegaly or signs of congestive cardiac failures to suggest carditis and also atrial fibrillation to suggest carditis as well. We can also do echocardiogram to look at the valve, especially the mitral valve, to look for any mitral stenosis as a complication of acute rheumatic fever. For treatment, the treatment of acute rheumatic fever aims to suppress the inflammatory response and also to minimize the cardiac damage, to provide symptomatic relief, and to eradicate the pharyngeal streptococcal infection, which is the primary cause. So we can ask the patient to bed rest, to restrict their activity until the acute phase reactants return to normal. We can also give anti-streptococcal therapy, which is oral penicillin V for 10 days. If the patient is allergic to penicillin V, we can change the medication to oral erythromycin also for 10 days. For anti-inflammatory therapy, it includes oral aspirin or prednisolone. Oral aspirin is for mild or there is no carditis, whereas oral prednisolone is for those patients where there is pericarditis or moderate to severe carditis. We can also give anti-failure medications like diuretics, S inhibitors, and digoxin. For secondary prophylaxis of rheumatic fever, we give intramuscular benzatine penicillin every three to four weeks, and also oral penicillin V twice daily. If they are allergic to penicillin V, again, we use oral erythromycin with the same dose. And how long should we give this prophylaxis? It is usually given until the patient is 21 years old or 5 years after the last attack of acute rheumatic fever, whichever was longer. And if the patient has carditis and valvular involvement, we give them lifelong prophylaxis. That's all for my video. Thank you.